We may have just had the most comprehensive and controlled early time restricted feeding study hit the scientific streets. And I know we've been talking about this topic quite a bit lately, but listen, I can't help if it keeps bringing those Hansel from Zoolander vibes. Hansel, so hot right now. All we can do is sit back and enjoy the show, which in this case, I guess is the data. Yeah, we'll go with that. Yo, 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 what is up? Welcome back to another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and longevity and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic manner. Today, we are yet again getting into the weeds on some of the cellular and metabolic changes that happen when we choose not to eat less, but to eat earlier a protocol which fights the societal norm that's been ingrained in our five pound mushy membrane since conception. Big late night fiestas. Well, okay, dinners. And who knows, by the end of this powwow, you may just be a dinner rebel yourself. So first we'll do a little recap of what exactly early eating is, then dive face first into this new data and finish up with my interpretation of what exactly it all means for us intelligent walking apes out there in the wild. Cause I mean, there's just a lot of variables out here that we kinda sorta need to deal with. Many having the potential to set our cellular and metabolic internal state on fire. Yeah, uh, let's not play with fire. And now that we got through the disclaimers, let's get into it. First, early eating. 101. As we discussed in many prior videos, more and more evidence continues to support the notion that meal timing has power. Displaying that consistently aligning our eating into strategic daily windows may be a simple, powerful way to get our health back in line and our clocks back in sync. What clocks, you ask? The most important one, our body clock or evolutionary wired biological rhythm, also known as our circadian rhythms, which ebb and flow in accordance to the light darkness cycles of that big flaming supernova up in the sky, the, the sun. But it just so happens when and how much we eat also entrains the biological clocks of our oh so important digestive organs as well. Turning them on, as we see in this video here, upon consumption a mechanism that has been thrown totally out of whack by our modern day 24 seven nonstop eating habits, causing a downstream flurry of suboptimal effects. Effects that consistent meal timing seem to alleviate. How? By entraining the body to know and prepare for food at a certain time each and every day. And in doing so, optimizing its function during digestion and allowing it to rest, upregulating, restorative, regenerating, and detoxifying pathways when it's off the clock. Sounds like a pretty good deal. A deal which has been displayed in both human and animal data. A lot of which we've covered on the fully loaded Fasting 101 playlist here. Displaying how consuming our energy, AKA our calories in a predefined window each and every day without changing anything else like caloric intake can have powerful impacts on our health. We're talking glucose stabilizing, insulin dropping, sirtuin activating, autophagy stimulating, stem cell reawakening, inflammation lowering, fat adapting effects. Effects that forward thinkers in the field suggest that early eating may optimize. Bringing forth the circadian alignment hypothesis, which argues that this type of eating aligns with the way that we've evolved to eat. Being better equipped to digest and metabolize energy during the day and reaping a higher quality, more restorative rest period as a byproduct. Interesting, right? This, along with a very positive N of one experience has made me a dinner rebel for around five years now a strategy and journey that we fully break down here. Now with that little primer, let's dive into what may be the most controlled study on this topic to date. I know, I'm excited too. The study. Researchers from Brigham and Women's Hospital sought to test the mechanisms that explain why late eating may increase the risk of obesity. To do this, they recruited 16 participants who were overweight or obese and had them complete a multi-week randomized, highly controlled crossover protocol. 
which enabled researchers to carefully test in subject changes while minimizing environmental and behavioral interference. Essentially what they did was randomize these individuals into an early eating group and late eating group for several weeks, including six days in laboratory conditions. And after a washout period of several weeks, they had them switch. The early eaters went to late eating and the late eaters went to early eating, all while consuming the same exact isocaloric meals and living in the same glorious laboratory conditions. Maybe a little sarcasm there. I don't know. I didn't see them. They might be nice. Who knows? This allowed them to observe individual cellular and metabolic changes driven by each respective eating protocol, specifically looking at perceived hunger, hormonal changes, energy expenditure, genetic expression, white adipose or fat tissue activity, and sleep quality to see how these key metabolic markers differed between each protocol. Speaking of protocols, researchers had participants start their protocol several weeks before even reaching the lab, first standardizing them on a eight hour habitual bedtime and then providing meals so they can start getting used to the protocol at home. The early protocol consisted of subjects consuming identical meals one hour, five hours, and nine hours after their habitual wake time, while the late eating protocol had subjects skip breakfast and consume their identical meals five, nine, and 13 hours after their habitual wake time. This ended up having most early eaters finishing their energy consumption by around 5.30 p.m. and late eaters finishing around 9.30 p.m. Now, I want to call out real quick that this time structure still had the late eating group finishing their last meal around two and a half hours before bedtime. Remember that. We're going to talk about it later. As for the lab period, it consisted of six consecutive days under constant conditions with rigorous blood tissue and sleep analysis. And when I say constant conditions, let me remind you of how extremely constant these conditions really were about as constant as you can get. Get this, room temperatures were kept at 23 degrees Celsius with 50 to 55% humidity. Light levels were tightly controlled, especially in the suites without any windows. Participants did not have access to phones, internet, radio, or visitors. What? Experimenters were present 24 hours a day to monitor data acquisition, biological specimens, and initiate tests. Starting to sound a little bit like a horror movie. Participants abstained from unscheduled exercise and naps. They all ate identical meals at the appropriate times and were forced to smile approximately 17 minutes per day. Okay, maybe not that last part. But everything else places this study as one of the most controlled ones ever done on the subject. So what happened? I thought you'd never ask. Let's start at the top of the list. First, it was displayed that late eating increased perceived hunger with data showing that it doubled the odds of participants being hungry compared to the early eaters. Huh, okay. I mean, but that could be like all psychological. What about some more objective metrics, like hunger and satiety hormones? What happened there? Well, when it comes to our two main appetite regulating hormones, leptin, which regulates satiety, and ghrelin, which promotes hunger, hormones, might I add, which also act as important feedback signals to the brain to influence energy expenditure, sympathetic tone, and propensity for anabolic versus catabolic processes throughout the body, it was found that during these 16-hour wake periods, late eating decreased average leptin by 16% and increased the ghrelin-leptin ratio by 34%. Huh, I guess perceived hunger wasn't lying. But those silly hormones don't tell you much about how total energy expenditure differed. I mean, we gotta know what's going on there before we can make any rash conclusions. Of course. Well, interestingly enough, it was found that late eating decreased waking energy expenditure. These outcomes were measured by indirect calorimetry 12 times during the 16 hour wake period each test day, finding that energy expenditure was significantly lower in the late eating group compared to the early, with participants expending around 60 fewer calories 
per waking day. Now, because energy expenditure was only assessed during the day and not the full 24 hour period, researchers got creative and measured core body temperature continuously across the 24 hour sleep wake cycle and used that as a proxy for energy expenditure. Here, they found that late eating significantly reduced average 24 hour core body temperature, especially during the 16 hour wake period, suggesting that there was no increase in energy expenditure throughout the night to offset the decrease in energy expenditure throughout the day. Okay, okay, all this is pretty intriguing, but what happened at the cellular and tissue level? The level that really matters. Well, after collecting samples of subcutaneous white adipose tissue, aka fat tissue, researchers observed that several cellular pathways displayed statistically significant differences in gene expression profiles. Didn't we just talk about gene expression? Oh yeah, that's right. Including a number of key pathways which regulate day-to-day, minute-to-minute, second-to-second cellular and metabolic activity, including pathways related to lipid metabolism and autophagy. Interestingly enough, lipid metabolism pathways showed the largest absolute change in genetic expression, with late eating downregulating several genes responsible for lipid breakdown and upregulating genes responsible for lipid synthesis. Huh, what could go wrong? All right, it affects metabolism, but what about the foundational component of all things health and longevity? The undisputed champ, sleep. I love that they looked into this. And not only looked into this, but measured it using the gold standard polysomnography, measuring night one and night five of each laboratory visit with an EEG or an electroencephalogram. And yes, it took me a couple of takes to pronounce that right, but we're all better for it. Here, they tested whether the meal schedule intervention caused any changes in total sleep, sleep quality, or sleep stages, finding that total sleep did not significantly differ between the two groups, nor did sleep efficiency, onset, latency, and stages, concluding that changes in sleep time and stages were unlikely to be an underlying mechanism for the observed effects of meal schedule on the outcomes measured in this protocol. A key note here was the fact that even the late night group was closely aligned with the sleep hygiene best practices of finishing your last big meal around two to three hours before bed. So that may or may not explain the lack of impact on sleep quality, but that's purely my dubious speculation. All in all, researchers concluded that their results suggest, despite identical 24-hour caloric intake, late eating resulted in a decrease in 24-hour circulating leptin levels, a simultaneous increase in the drive for energy intake, and concurrent decrease in energy expenditure. Additionally, altering human adipose tissue gene expression towards increased adipogenesis and decreased lipolysis, which may promote fat accumulation. And they state, to our knowledge, this is the first study demonstrating that effect of late eating on adipose tissue. Wow, what a ride. But what does it all mean? Well, First off, we must acknowledge that this was a very small study with a specific demographic of middle-aged overweight adults. Duration was short and it solely looked into the acute effects of early eating in already metabolically disrupted individuals. That being said, the small sample size also has its advantages, such as allowing for a highly controlled environment as well as elaborate, expensive, testing, something that is typically just not practical at a large scale. Now, as for the results, you know we always like to look at these things through the lens of longevity. And even though this study was intended to explore late eating's role on obesity risk, I think it provided some really valuable information around cellular and metabolic health as a whole, which as we know is tightly coupled to living as the healthiest, most functional you for as long as humanly possible, AKA that longevity thing. So in terms of my analysis, 
first, it seems to support that circadian alignment hypothesis, displaying pretty much across the board that subjects had more advantageous cellular and metabolic markers when they ate strategically earlier rather than later. And I think that this also speaks to time-restricted feeding in general as all participants consume their energy in 10 hour windows or less. And although participants in the early eating group saw better subjective and objective measurements, it would be super interesting to see how the late group compared to their baseline of eating whenever and however much ad libitum. I would hypothesize that we would see a clear positive benefit. However, it seems that the true magic may very well be in the combo. When you mix the E or the early with the TRF, time-restricted feeding, and this highly controlled, elaborate, well-done study only makes the protocol more compelling. A strategy when performed in the real chaotic world, you know, that world riddled with constant stress, emotion, and 24 seven access to some of the tastiest, most metabolically damaging foods to ever exist, could even have more substantial benefits. So even though this study was short and sweet, the pure fact that there was such a substantial amount of change in that limited amount of time is straight up promising. Because as we know, longevity is a byproduct of cellular and metabolic efficiency over time, which happens to be a byproduct of daily lifestyle. And once again, we circle back to the oh so common theme here that you, me, us humans are all in more control than we may think. Yeah, we'll never be able to control things with 100% certainty, but the data has shown that we can certainly influence our odds, likelihood, and probability of longevity over time, simply by deploying the habits that bring out the very best in our biological wiring. And eating a little bit earlier may just be one of them. But what do I know? I'm just a crazy health and longevity dude on the tube of Ube, who happens to host weekly longevity challenges in Patreon, where we as a team build and implement the aforementioned sustainable change week by week, habit by habit, focusing on getting healthy from the inside out. If interested, all the links to that will be in the show notes below. Listen, when it comes to this thing called health, there is never going to be a single silver bullet. It takes an intentional effort, humility to understand what works for someone else may not work for you. And wisdom to understand that there are multiple ways to reach this cellular and metabolic nirvana, all of which have one common denominator, owning it. So make the intentional choice to do just that. You won't be sorry you did. Unlike Derek when he made his Merman commercial. Yeah, kind of reminds me of a uh, big late night meal. What? Just saying. <laughs> <laughs>